in 2024, it'd be uh, uh, in late winter, uh, February to March, somewhere in there. And uh, we're going to have an informational meeting next Sunday after church, the 22nd, down the big room after church. So if you're at all interested in that, want some information on that, uh, please show up at that meeting. We'll see what kind of interest we have um, uh, in terms of taking that trip. It should be an exciting time. I'm going to open our time this morning with, uh, with some of Paul's words again. I love his prayers to the church. I, I think they're very appropriate for us uh, today. He says this, this is in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you might be filled with the measure of all of the fullness of God. And I think as we have uh, introduced uh, our theme for the year, uh, Renew, which by the way, there's, uh, these are in your bulletins and these are bookmarks. I encourage you to just keep these in your Bible for the year just to remind you. But um, uh, yeah, that, that word grasp there is, is not a, a, um, a, uh, a comprehension of facts, but it's an apprehension of those facts and apprehending who God is and understanding at a greater depth the fullness of who God is and what makes him who he is. And so um, we're going to be talking about that a little bit later as well as we um, get to that this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you humbled by your goodness, humbled by your faithfulness, your justice, um, and all the other character qualities that make you who you are, that, that, that make the fullness of God just that the fullness. And so, Father, uh, certainly that's uh, in infinite measure as you are infinite and we are finite, which makes it difficult for us to grasp hold of those things. But, Father, help us even today as we work through that. We're thankful, Lord, today for how you've revealed yourself in your word, in your creation, but especially this morning in your Son who came and lived among us that we might know you. And, Father, um, and even beyond that, uh, came and died in our place and rose again in victory over sin. Father, we, we come together today uh, humbled. We come uh, expectant and just seeking after you this morning, Father, uh, corporately as your body, uh, not only here but, Father, around the world uh, as people gather in their respective churches and local churches to do so. And so, Father, we look to you. We thank you. We just love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand this morning. Let's uh, worship together through our problems. Let's not leave our problems outside. Let's worship him through our problems and leave him at his feet. And I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone.
so much that you are alive you rose again and you are our hope there's no hope in this world we need to look to you for hope in your son jesus lord we just pray this in your name we thank you amen you may be seated in your bulletins today there was uh, the missionary update was in there and this uh month of the year, we typically uh, tend to look at the uh, other areas other than the normal missionaries or the missionaries that we support or partner with as a church. Um, <clears throat> and the 1040 window is what's highlighted this, this, uh, this month. That, that's uh, a window that runs through North Africa and into Asia. Um, 
Two-thirds of the world's population lives there, and it's the most under-evangelized portion of the world in the world. Um, uh, uh, 95% plus of people um, are, are not evangelized, have not been evangelized in that area, do not know the gospel, or are actively seeking to um, go in a different direction. But there's a lot of people that live there, and so we're going to be praying through the month for uh, um, for that area of the world. We have people that we partner with um, uh, in an area of the world that is not open to missionaries, typically, um, for most of those countries anyway. Um, and so um, people have to go there uh, with other um, uh, skill sets. Uh, they have to have a job, uh, start a business, do something there that, that becomes an asset then to those countries. And then they live Christ out in the context of their, of their daily goings, comings and goings as well. So be praying for those folks. We have a number of people uh, that we have um, uh, some contact with, partnering with to some level uh, from our church, but there's many, many people that live there in that area of the world. So be praying for the 1040 window this month as, as the Lord brings that up to you. I encourage you to keep, keep this on your kitchen table or wherever you tend to eat. And uh, pray for that as, as you have that opportunity. So that's that. Um, uh, there's also coming up uh, a Priority One mission trip. Um, if at the end of February is the dates that they're looking for. There's an interest meeting for that coming up on January 29th uh, down in the big room as well. And uh, John Heiser is going to be leading that group. And um, so if you're interested in going down to New York City and doing some mission work, um, they tend to do a number of different things while they're down there for the long weekend. Um, and so a uh, good opportunity to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and begin to minister. Um, uh, so that's coming. So um, keep that on your agenda as well. Uh, another thing that we have starting up here at the, in the beginning of February is the uh, Financial Peace University, which is a a program similar to Grief Share. Um, it meets for a number of weeks. I think there's nine weeks in the, the Financial Peace um, program. And uh, Fanny Clements runs that with Natasha Nowicki, I think, is going to be helping. Or Nowicki. I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> Sorry, Natasha. Is she here? She's not here. Uh, good. Hopefully she's not watching. <laughs> Brunner. Natasha Brunner. Yes. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, they run that class, and uh, so that's you can contact Fanny or Natasha, and uh, they'll get you hooked into that, um, and you'll be ready to go for that. So, great way to uh, think through as we begin a new year, uh, our budget and what we do with our finances and what the, why God has given us finances to start with and what to do with those, all for His glory. It's a great uh, tool for us. And there's a video, I think, uh, coming up here, and Tim can get that running, and then uh, for close to 20 good to go. Years. Families have been changing their futures through Financial Peace University. I started it with a bad suit and an overhead projector. So I set the room for 135 people, four people came. And now today we've had over one and a half million families go through this course. That's over two million people across this nation. You may be wondering, what is it? What Financial Peace University is about is a return to God's ways of handling money, but in a very practical, step-by-step, game plan showing you exactly how to do it. FPU is about learning how to control your money. When you make these dollars behave, you're going to get this sense of power over your money that you've never, ever had. Don't move into a home with 62 debts or six debts or, or two debts and no money. You move into a home broke with a bunch of debt around your neck, Murphy will move in your spare bedroom, bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. Marriages are being made stronger. Couples are learning how to talk to each other about money and getting on the same page. The closest statistical correlation to success going through this program are those that actively engage in this budgeting process. And for those that are married, they're doing it together. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you get disgusted and you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I am not going to live like this anymore. We're done. We're changing this thing. Talk about the why. Talk about your dreams. Ask your spouse, what would we do? Where would we travel to? What would we buy? What would be changed if we became something as a couple where we were working together on that? Now, man, I'm sure you know this, and we've been talking about it for the last few minutes, but it's very true. Women are different, aren't they? Say yes. yes. One of the things you may or may not know is they have a gland right in here that you don't have. It's called the security gland. 
And when she is feeling insecure due to money issues, that gland spasms. And it is attached to her face. This nine lesson, 90 minute class will challenge you. Now this is a boot camp. I'm your coach. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable sometimes. You're gonna go home and go, I don't really like him tonight. Now, now if I agree with that, which would make you wrong. <laughs> That's what happens when the coach coaches you, doesn't it? He kind of rubs you the wrong way. There's a little friction on there, right? I've had some good coaches and they lit me up a time or two, but it caused me to go places I couldn't go otherwise. Life change is never easy, but you won't be alone. You'll watch a DVD each week and discuss it with your small group. Your classmates will encourage you and help you take those first steps. You'll walk away from FPU knowing how to relate with money. You'll learn how to pay off debt and save for the future. And you'll learn how to protect your plan. We aren't born knowing everything we need to about money. We learn, and there's no better place to learn than the Word. The Bible offers more than 800 scriptures on money, and Financial Peace University is based on that solid foundation. You are literally going to be doing things every week differently than you ever have based on biblical principles. And things like doing a budget, things like working with your spouse, things like singles having an accountability partner, things like teaching your kids so that a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. It's not theory. This is actual application on everything. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? What would happen? If the, what would happen to the kingdom of God if the people of God were out of debt? All you need is a plan. Financial Peace University is that plan. That's an awesome program. I would For close to 20 years. To anybody, even if you don't have problems with money, come get educated in the way God wants you to use it. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. Uh, we thank you for all that you're doing uh, here in your local body. Um, we thank you uh, for your promise uh, as we look into our new year um, that even though outwardly we can be wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed each and every day. And uh, I just pray that for everyone here. Um, and I just pray that uh, for our year as a church. I just pray that you would renew us, that we would look to you. Um, I also pray for uh, our local mission field, uh, our community here. I just pray that this year you would, uh, you would use us to impact um, our community in lots of different ways, um, using Grief Share, Financial Peace, uh, Awana, Youth Group, uh, just the tons of other ministries that happen uh, on a daily basis and weekly basis here. Um, I pray that you would uh, uh, let people in our church be available for that, that we would... Uh, uh, make time in, in busy schedules uh, to be available to you. And uh, I just thank you for um, your spirit and the way it leads us and guides us. And I just pray that you'd open our hearts uh, today as we look at your word. In your name we pray. Amen. We stand. To a king who reigns over all, never changes or turns. Failing justice, fading grace, whose promises remain. Yes, your promises remain. I want you a king who reigns over all, never changes or turns. Sing, 
How great is your faithfulness From age to age we will proclaim How great is your faithfulness How great is your faithfulness From generation to generation you never fail us, O oh God. Yesterday, and today, and tomorrow, until the day you return. The heavens ring, the saints all sing. How great is your faithfulness. From age to age, we will proclaim. How great is your faithfulness. The heavens ring. The saints all sing, how great is your faithfulness. From age to age, we will proclaim, how great is your faithfulness. How great is your faithfulness. sing praise to you this morning. Lord, we pray for open minds and open hearts as we hear the message to live in this world through your eyes, not ours. Lord, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Vineyard Church may be dismissed. All right, I'm going to go to prayer again here this morning. Father, we again come before your throne of grace with humble hearts, Father, that want to hear from you, that want 
you ultimately, Father. And so uh, help us this morning. Um, help me as I speak. Help all of us, Father, as we listen. Um, and to be changed because of your word, because of your spirit using it in such a way that, Lord, that we, we can't remain the same. And so, Father, we seek after you this morning. We give you all the glory and the praise, and uh, just help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, when our oldest son, Ross, is in the Marines, well, he's still in the Marines, but um, he spent four years in 29 Palms, California, uh, which sounds like this exotic place, doesn't it? 29 Palms, that sounds cool, you know, except for when we went to visit him there, we we realized that they call it 29 Palms officially, but it's it's really called 29 Stumps because trees don't grow there. It's in the middle of the desert, and so there's not much there. Matter of fact, it was really strange driving down the road in town, and there's a Pizza Hut there, and, and Pizza Hut had, had green grass in front of the Pizza Hut, this little square chunk of grass that they had to water four times a day to keep it green because it just doesn't stay green there. Um, yeah, uh, Nicole would, would hang the laundry out, and by the time she got all the laundry hung up, she could go back and, on this side and start to pull it down because it dried so fast. If, if you made a sandwich and were outside eating it, by the time you got to the second half of the sandwich, you were eating croutons. <laughs> you get the picture. The desert is a harsh place to live. It's very difficult uh, to, to, to scratch out an existence there. Uh, but part of, part of that, that area, um, of California anyway, uh, there's a national um, park there called Joshua Tree National Park, and it's, it's uh, just rocks and dirt. There's really not much else there. Um, the kids, we, we loved going there because was, there was all these kind of mountains and stuff that, that were all just rock, and so the climbing was just a lot of fun. We'd go in there, um, and there was these weird trees called Joshua Trees, and I should have put a picture of it. It didn't look anything like that plant. Um, they're really strange-looking trees. I encourage you to look them up. Um, but in one little corner of the park, there was, there was what was called an oasis, there's a spring of water there that, that was lush. Matter of fact, I think all the 29 palms and 29 palms were all right there um, the, in, in that oasis uh, where, the, where the, that water comes up and plants grow there and the animals collect there. And so in the midst of a, a dry and thirsty land, there's an oasis there, which is a place of safety and provision and security. Now, last week we began to introduce our theme for the year. Um, which is called Renew, and the title gives us a picture of a, a really a, a, a somewhere that's dry and thirsty. It gives us a picture that something's broken or in decline and needs to be renewed. That's why we're that's why we're looking at that. I invite you to join me back in Second Corinthians chapter four again this week. Uh, we looked at last week the bookend statements that begin and end chapter four. We do not lose heart, as Paul tells us. And I asked you to do some heart work this week, and I pray that you did some heart work. The question was, do you really want to know God, or do you just really want to know about God? And to be honest with you, this morning I sadly had to answer that question, honestly, not as much as I thought I did. I'm not happy with that answer, but I recognize that I'm, that I'm probably more attached to this world in some ways than, that I, than I thought that maybe I was or am. Uh, we will call those heart idols that we talk about oftentimes, um, and I have them just as you do. Uh, so I pray that you don't fire me because your pastor has uh, problems, um, yeah, just like the rest of us do. Still a work in progress, I guess, right? Yeah, on the positive side, though, my dissatisfaction with my answer to do I really want to know God or just know about Him um, pushes me, uh, it pushes my relationship with Him at a deeper level towards something more, something, something, something authentic, and not just something that I place um, platitudes upon. That speaks really to the, to the renewal of our soul that we're talking about this year, looking at. So let me read for us this morning. Last week we looked at the, the whole chapter kind of in outline form. Um, 
chapter 4. Today we're going to focus in on, on really verse 16 and the other second half of that. It says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Now again, we're going to focus on that second part of of verse 16 today, which again says, Outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. So let's unpack that a little bit for us this morning. Let's start out by talking about the the fact that the body is temporary. Paul says, outwardly, we're wasting away. That's the truth that that I'll I'll, I'll talk for all of us. Most of us don't like as we get older. You know, we eat, we work out at the gym. To, to try to reverse the curse of sin upon our, our physical bodies. Paul reminds us here of the stark reality that outwardly, which refers again to our bodies, we're wasting away. Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, falling into decline. I think of my own life, and I think, you know, when I was in, the, in my 30s, probably I thought at, at that point in time I was at my peak physical and emotional kind of well-being, strength was kind of there. Even into my 40s, I I thought I was invincible. I could do just about anything I really wanted to do. Uh, The 50s, however, began to recognize more of a decline that was happening. It was beginning to multiply quicker. In my 60s now, it's not just physical. Ordinary tasks just take longer now. Like to get to, to work at the same time in the morning, I have to get up an hour earlier. why that is. I still feel like I'm 20. It's funny. But my body tells me otherwise. Yeah. And I begin to look at the calendar, and I recognize that the road that's behind me is way longer than what is probably still in front of me, than almost for sure still in front of me. And we wonder why this is so. Why would, why would God give us a body that that he created to be healthy, that he created to live forever and find ourselves wasting away. The answer is not because God is a bad God or doesn't want what's best for us. That's not the answer. The answer is that, that we are. We're bad people. Because of that, sin has entered into the world. Genesis 3 shows us that. Sin and rebellion that that Adam and Eve, um, uh, when they chose to eat of the fruit against God's greater advice to them, his counsel to them to not eat from, has entered into the creation. It's, It's altered our eternal nature of our body and the eternal destination of our soul. And that's what we are, body and soul, body and spirit. We could use that term. So when sin entered into the world, our bodies became temporary. And we now struggle through life and into death. Our soul, which was in union with God in the garden, is now in a sinful state and destined for hell. That's not because God is mean. It points to his justice. And he will judge all sin. It's our sin that has broken what God has created and left us desperately needing deep renewal of the soul. Otherwise, we're destined to live out our fading days in a hopeless pursuit of something different. Thankfully, there is another part to the story. The body is temporary. The soul is eternal. Paul talks about that here. Is it the inward? Inwardly, we are being renewed. Speaking of our soul there or our spirit, that's the part of our being that, that uh, uh, at the moment in time when we were conceived in our mother's womb, soul kicked in and soul began. The body also at the same time became uh, a body. 
And yes, the body will die because of sin, but the soul continues onward into eternity, eternity future. Where we're hopelessly, eternally lost in sin, God Himself took on human flesh. He came into the world to carry out His plan to save sinners, to save their souls from eternal death. He did that by dying in our place for our sin and rising again, defeating sin, defeating death, reversing the curse. We could use that term. It's faith in, in Him. It's, faithful, it's faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ that connects us to the eternal God. It's faith in that gospel that turns my sinful state into a forgiven state. And that's a reality. It doesn't change or affect sins. It doesn't change sin's effect on my body, but it does affect or change its effect on our, my soul. Paul tells us here at the moment that we believed in Jesus Christ for the, for the, the forgiveness of our sin, we're made new creations in Christ. Speaking of that renewal, that, that new uh, um, life that we have that's in Him, where we were dead in our sin and now we're alive in Christ. That's a renewal, isn't it? God has renewed our soul and hidden, hidden, hidden us in Christ for all of eternity. He's transferred us, again, from being dead to being alive. He's renewed us in Him. The Scripture tells us that, that one day we'll get new glorified bodies. I'm waiting for that day. Yeah, each day I get a little bit closer to it to replace this dying earth suit that, I'm, that my soul is kept in right now. It's the ultimate renewal that we long for. But Paul here in this passage isn't speaking of coming to Christ and the new creation that we are as terms of the renewal. He's talking about a little bit of a different renewal. He's talking about a continuous renewal, a day-by-day renewal, as he speaks of here. We're being renewed day by day. And he says it that way rather than saying we have been renewed already in Christ. He's speaking of this different renewal, this, this renewal. We would call that progressive sanctification, something that's happening in our hearts, in our lives, on a day-by-day basis. God is working in our lives to reveal himself, not as a one-time event, but as a continuous working of the Holy Spirit to deepen our relationship with him and to renew our soul day by day. And, and it's there where, we, where it gets tricky for us sometimes, I think. It's to seeing what God is doing in our lives. That renewal of the soul and the deepening of our relationship with God doesn't happen at the oasis where life is easy, where life is comfortable, where all my needs are taken care of. It happens out in the desert, typically. Take a quick walk through the Scriptures and we see this principle at work all the way through. Adam and Eve were in the oasis to begin with living there in the garden, yet chose to eat of the forbidden fruit, or then were moved out into where? Into the wilderness, into the desert. Only there could they learn the depth of God's forgiveness. Only there would they learn the the depth of God's grace to them, His mercy, His faithfulness. Abraham needed to leave the oasis of Ur to be led out into the desert, into the wilderness where God was leading him to the place he did not know, it says. He gets them out there and he provides then a a famine in the promised land. How could the promised land have a famine? Where Abraham had to learn something about God. They had to learn how to trust him in the midst of that. The desert is the place of learning. Israel as a whole, after 400 years of slavery in, in Egypt, were led where? Into the desert, into the wilderness. Lots of deep lessons out there. Unfortunately, much like us, they didn't do a good job of learning those lessons because they were more more focused on their circumstances than they were on who was leading them through the desert. The things they needed to learn, they didn't learn. And they grumbled continuously rather than being renewed continuously. There's a hint for what we're going to look at as we go through this year a little bit. Even Jesus 
right after the high point of his baptism, the dove coming down and landing on him, and hearing the words of his heavenly Father saying, uh, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can you think of a, a more joyous, a, a, a greater time that that would be in someone's life? Let's just, let's just hang out here for a while. This is awesome, right? I'm con- it's comfortable here. It's, it's a good thing. But the scripture tells us that immediately after that, he's led out from that place into the desert, into the wilderness. By who? By the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit led him out into the, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. What a, what a contrast in those two events that happen one right after another. Paul, the great preacher to the Gentiles, uh, although filled with joy in the work of the gospel, he writes these words for us uh, uh, because he was, he was pushed out into the desert right after, uh, in the midst of this as I read already, these light and momentary troubles. He's going through difficulties, hardships in his life, continuously, one after another. Paul understands that that being a uh, 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 that that um, being in the desert, that's where God renews the soul and makes us secure in Him. We don't like that because we like the oasis. That's the comfortable place for us to hang out. Yeah, James one takes that a little bit further. Turn there in your, in your Bibles to James chapter 1. This is one of those passages I think is, is just so helpful to us in our lives and understanding why difficulty happens and what God is doing in the midst of them, the purpose of them. It should be one of those passages you have highlighted. Chapter 2, if you don't get your highlighter out, highlight it. Uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, Whenever you're in the oasis and things are going really awesome for you. Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't say that. Sorry, I got carried away. Yeah, it doesn't say that. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let, and, and then there's this command here. Let perseverance finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's in the midst of the trials that we typically try to short-circuit what God is doing. We don't let that trial then or that perseverance finish its work because we don't persevere. We jump at something to, to fill the gap. We jump at something to get us back into the oasis that God has for us. Where God really has for us is in the desert. We short circuit what He's trying to do, which means then He's got to come up with another plan for that. Not that God comes up with another plan, but for us it would be anyway. That's one thing of theme that we see all through God's self revelation is is that we need to leave the oasis in the comfort that it provides, and God meets us out in the desert. Because it's out in the desert that we see the depth of His mercy and His grace and His compassion and His judgment and His sovereignty and His goodness and the fullness of all that make Him who He is. We won't recognize those things in the oasis. As I mentioned last week, oftentimes our desire for comfort is what keeps us from knowing God. We like that comfort. And we're afraid that if we, if we leave that comfort that God might ask us to do something that we really be uncomfortable for us, out of our comfort zone. We, we, we use that phrase all the time. And so what oftentimes happens is that, that God then has to move us into the desert. And, and I think sometimes, and I hope nobody's offended by this, because we've been hanging out at the Oasis our, our, the depth of our knowledge of who God is is about an inch deep, and we get out in the wilderness, and that inch deep faith doesn't quite cut it very well. We need to grow. And that's why God moves us out there, is to take that inch deep faith and stretch it, make it deeper, make it wider. We don't like that. So we get out there in the desert with our inch deep thank inch deep faith and that's where the grumbling starts right it's exactly where it starts yeah we long for that earthly oasis rather than heaven that's still ahead of us but this is not heaven this is the desert 
And oftentimes it looks like this. We spend our lifetime building our lives in the oasis where it's happy and comfortable and we can be, in, we can be secure there where all things are good. What we would assume or think is the full blessing of God in our lives, sort of like those little baby wood ducks. And you put your wood duck box up, and if you have a pond or a swamp or whatever, and you put those ducks in boxes, they're about this big, you'll see them out there. They're about this big, and they have a hole in them. Anyway, the wood ducks fly up in there, and they have their babies in there, right? And when the babies are in there, that's a secure place. Mom's feeding them. It's, you know, the animals can't get in there and get them. It's a secure place. That's what we think of oftentimes. Happy and comfortable. But at least two things, and I I could probably name a number more too, but at least a couple things happen in the life of the oasis that I think we need to be aware of. First is that our knowledge of God doesn't grow deeper day by day. Those wood ducks in the box, they they don't have a knowledge of what it's like out of the box. They don't know what it's like out there. They don't have to know what it's like out there. And oftentimes I think we fool ourselves into thinking that, that we don't need any more renewal than our initial salvation of when we first came to Christ. Although that was, a, that was a full renewal, at least in spiritual life anyway. Second thing that I think happens after, the first is we don't grow in our depth of knowledge of who God is. Secondly, we never grow in perseverance. We never, we never become complete, as James talks about. And so we end up in our lives, in the comfortable oasis, we have our salvation of Jesus, and then we just go live life the way we want to go live life. Without any thought of what God is doing in the midst of life. And so, what does a good God do when we get complacent in the oasis of life? He's like the mother wood duck. He kicks us out of the nest. Right? Get out of here. That's what the mother does. In other words, the babies would still be there today in the freezing cold, but they're not because mom kicked him out of the nest. That's what God does. He either kicks us out of the nest or he dries up the spring in the oasis. So it becomes a desert because God knows that it's out in the desert that we learn the depth of our knowledge of him. It's out in the desert that we, our souls are renewed, not in our circumstances, but renewed in him. That's where we find him. It's out in the desert that we learn how to trust God in a situation that is beyond our ability to control. We like to control things, don't we? Yeah, we, we, we like to know what the outcome is. And so we control our, our, our desires and we control our, uh, or the desires ultimately, control our, our actions, our thinking based on what we want it to be. But God might have a different plan than we do. His plan for us is to grow us, to sanctify us. And in the oasis, we don't really get to the end of our abilities because we're happy and comfortable there. Things, life is good. But in the desert, things are outside of our control. Things are beyond our abilities to deal with. And, and it's out in the desert that then God takes that experience and reveals himself in the midst of it. To help us to trust in Him when life is hard. Of course, even when we get out there, we still don't like it out there. We still continue to grumble. And so we do some other things that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks that, that hinder our growth. First thing we do is we question, why would a good God do such a dastardly thing as to send me out in the desert? And we become angry with Him. Much like Israel did in the desert. Which turns into then a longer desert stay for us, just like it was with Israel. So we want to avoid that. The, other, the second thing that oftentimes we do when we're out in the desert, because we don't like it out there, we turn to sin. We grab hold of sin because sin has a promise that it's going to return us to the oasis. Return to the things that are secure and easy in life. And so we, we grab hold of those things, and certainly it, it doesn't follow through with that promise, but it promises us nonetheless, and so we grab hold of that sin. 
We think that sin is going to get us back. We see that certainly in, in the life of Abraham and lying about his wife when he was in Egypt, or we see it in David staying behind when the troops were going out to war. We could go you know, one thing after another after another in the Scripture and see that, and I think we could see it in our own lives as well. When difficulty comes, we, we tend to turn towards something that makes us comfortable and happy rather than turning to God and finding His grace. There's a third one here, too, I think, and this is where it, one that gets tricky. Oftentimes, we substitute the disciplines of our faith or some spiritual experience for truly knowing and experiencing God. That's what we know what to do, and, when, and, and it isn't bad in and of itself. I'm not saying that you should put down your Bible when difficulty comes. No, it's time to pick up your Bible. Absolutely. But if we substitute that for knowing God at the depth of who He is, then it's going to produce oftentimes more difficulty in our lives. So next we will look at those. Those things are short circuit, a renewal process rather than to multiplying it in our lives. So how do we experience God? What does that look like in our lives? Unfortunately, there's, there's not a prescribed. I can't say, okay, step one is to do this, step two is this, step three is this, step four. Uh, uh, and, and there's a process in that in our lives. Um, that, in a step-by-step process anyway that I can lay out for you today. But here's a couple things that I think will help us in the midst of, of this renewal process in our lives. The first one is to submit to the process, which means obviously there, there is a process, just not a prescribed process of step one, two, three, four. Okay? But God has a process in it, and the process is get out in the desert. We have to recognize that, that the process itself is not a microwave process. It's more of a slow cooker. You know, when you put your food in the microwave, you know, if they put, uh, like, raw vegetables in there and stuff, the microwave doesn't really cook them and draw the juices and, and stuff out of the, the, the good stuff out of the vegetables or out of the meat that I'm doing. A slow cooker, however, you know, I put the stuff in there. My grandmother used to make uh, what you called a, I don't know, boiled dinner or whatever. It had meat in there and, and vegetables and stuff. And the broth that came from that was a rich and deep broth that she would make as a result of that. And our, our spiritual lives are that way as well. Day by day, Paul tells us here, the process that deepens and makes rich our knowledge of our relationship with God. There's no shortcut, there's no fast track to make that happen. It's a day-by-day process. We hate that. In our immediate, got to have it my way, you know, got to have it yesterday, life culture that we live in. The fact that that we are so results-driven rather than process-driven slows down, hinders the growth. I've been serving God and I still don't have enough money to pay my bills. What's he doing? I've been doing all these things God wants me to do with my wife, and she's still argumentative with me all the time. That's the day-by-day process that God is renewing our soul through in the midst of using the finances, using our marriage to produce all the depth and the riches of the, the deep, the juicy stuff the fruit of the Spirit that God is developing in the midst of those desert experiences in our lives to bring about a Christ-likeness in us, to enrich not just our lives, but to bring Him glory as we respond to them in the way that He would have us to. And so our part, beginning anyway, is to submit to the process, to recognize that God is using a long process keeping us in the desert oftentimes Um, because that's how he's caring for us because what's best for us is to know him deeper. That's what Paul prays for in Ephesians. You see it in in almost every one of Paul's letters. He's praying for the church of Jesus Christ to know God better, to know God deeper, how wide and long is the the love of Christ, to know who he is. Second thing I think it would be helpful for us to get out of the oasis journey out into the desert every once in a while, which doesn't uh, uh, make, doesn't take too much for us to to do since we live in a broken world that only really gives us a little bit of a uh, uh, taste of what the, the oasis really is, which is ultimately really heaven. Um, but since we live in a broken world, 
we're in the desert routinely most of the time anyway, right? <laughs> you know, that's just life. But sometimes we're just in a rut. Even in the oasis, life can be dry. And that's like God's Spirit working to renew us in Him, to deepen our knowledge and understanding of who He is. And in the flesh, we might wonder where God went or why He's doing what He's doing. And oftentimes, many people stop pursuing or they just don't know what to do. Sometimes we just need to venture outside the oasis, our comfort zone, where we might experience more of the fullness of God out there in the wilderness. And I think oftentimes what, what keeps us some from going out into the desert is our fear of what might happen out there. But I tell you, Moses said this when the children of Israel, when, when God told them, you go into the promised land, I'm, I'm not going with you, but you go. And Moses said, if you're not going, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm staying where you are. And I think oftentimes we mistake the, the blessing of the oasis for God's presence there, which it may or may not be. Maybe he's out in the desert. We're going to be where he is. Yeah, and so that fearfulness um, that the desert might have for us, if God's not out there, that's a scary place. Not the place where we want to be. We want to be with him. And if he's out there, then that's a different story because it would be more scary to remain in the, in the oasis than it would be to go out to the desert if that's where he is. It's our lack of knowing God that keeps us, I think, oftentimes from that place. Because it's safer and easier because we, we get to stay in the comfort of the little life that we've built and the little kingdom of Jack, you know, that I talk about all the time. Um, and, you know, we are all building our little kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah. But quickly it becomes a godless existence because we're building our little kingdom where we think we have some control over. Yeah, but it leaves us wanting more at the end of it, desiring something deeper. And again, I'm not saying it's time to, pers to stop pursuing those spiritual disciplines that are so helpful to us. You know, going to church, serving other people, reading the scriptures, studying it, applying it to our lives. Those are all so important. Those are the building blocks of knowing God. But if that is the existence, if that's the fullness of the God that we think we know, we don't know him very well. He's way beyond all of those things. We do those because we know him. We're going to talk about that over the next few weeks as well. We need those things. Whether we're in the oasis or whether we're in the desert, those things have to stay in place. It is, however, time to stop using those as a substitute for knowing Him. Again, we're going to cover that more next week. I'm going to conclude with this today, kind of leave you a little bit hanging. Um, some more things for, to think, for us to think about and to consider. It's not the comfort of the oasis that we need, but the one who is the oasis that we need, the one who renews us with living water in the midst of wherever we are. He's the one that we need to know. Not the circumstances, not the place that we find ourselves. He's the one we need. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise today. We thank you for these words of Paul uh, that we look at today. Though outwardly our bodies are wasting away, yet inwardly our souls are being renewed day by day. And, and as I think about that, is that true? Could we say that of ourselves, that yes, I'm being renewed day by day. I'm knowing God deeper today than I did yesterday. Lord, I, I pray that would be we would be able to answer it that way, answer that question. That yes, I, I agree, you're renewing my soul day by day, whether I find myself at the oasis or whether I find myself in the desert. Either place, I need you. And so, Father, help us. Renew our hearts, our desires, Father, to, to desire you more and more. And desire the things of this world less and less. 
Father, we give you praise today. We thank you that you are available to us. That as Paul challenges us to to know the depth and the height and the width of your love for us and to know the fullness of God that, that as you have revealed yourself to us to that extent, Lord, we can know the fullness of who you are. Help us, Lord, in that. That's a pursuit that's that, that we need to be desiring because that's what triggers the renew process in our lives. Father, we give you praise today. We thank you. Starting us on this journey, Lord, but not just starting us and then leaving us flopping around. Father, you, you've, you continue to lead us. You continue to draw us. You continue, continue to pull us towards you. Help us, Father, to go willingly rather than kicking and screaming. Father, we seek after you today. We, we just love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. As we sing this last chorus, all you can just think about the words. As we get in the desert this week, and it, the desert's a scary place, but just think about this chorus of this song. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. That's, that's a beautiful chorus. And just let that ring as you put Jack's message into the works this week. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my name. Let's do it one more time. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ. My living hope, oh God, you are my living hope. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're out in the desert this week, learning about you and having you pick us up, take these words and let them ring in our head. Lord, the desert's a scary place, I know it is for me but you are our living hope. We should know you better. Strive to know you better throughout our life. Circumstances come and go, but you are constant. Lord, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.